Hello, everyone. Good morning. I guess almost good afternoon. Uh, I just want to first off thank DeepSec for having me back because I was supposed to be here a couple of years ago, but you know, thanks to my daughter, my back was out. So here I am. So yes, I'm here to talk about the examination of tool, some of the tools, some of the actors, and the defenses that are available. And I just want to be crystal clear, this is not a vendor-related pitch in any way, shape, or form. But we do have data from our platform that'll be using, so I just want to make sure that I'm clear with that up front, because I don't like to sit in a crowd and have somebody go, well, if you click this button, and then, then nobody enjoys that. So why am I standing here talking to you? I have been in this industry space for over 20 years now. And before I came over to join Akamai about two and a half years ago, I did about 20 years on your side of the phone, if you're a defender. I have worked in all manner of companies, from uh, a couple of power companies, uh, several banks, uh, U.S. Department of Defense, which, to be clear, I'm a Canadian, so I was actually rather impressed they let me mess around with their firewalls at the Pentagon. Um, and it has been an a really entertaining career for me, and as a result, as I've gone along, I've collected a lot of stories. And I'm going to drive the cameraman nuts because I wander, so I apologize in advance. Um, and one, with the stories that I've managed to collect, I'm able to actually write a lot of stories. And as a result of those stories, I have been able to write for CSO Online, Forbes, and a few others. And that's one of the things I really enjoy, is being able to actually share these experiences with folks, and not from a, you know, look how great of a hacker I am because that ship sailed 20 years ago. Um, now I get to chase paper around a desk and come talk to good folks like you. So I really enjoy this opportunity that I'm able to actually come out and talk and share these stories. And hopefully you're able to actually take something away from this to help you know, improve in your own uh, in environment such that it be. And in my copious time, I actually like to hang out with my family. Nothing like waking up at 5 o'clock in the morning with two small children going, Daddy, play with us. It's awesome. But I do feel like this a lot of the time with a lot of the conversations that I have regarding cloud. Uh, especially when it comes to larger organizations and government, which are still entrenched in the idea of cloud is rather scary. Uh, it really isn't. Um, there's a sticker that I've seen on a few laptops that says cloud is just somebody else's computer. To, agree, to a degree, that is actually true. But the reality is that it's offloading it so that you can actually do a better job with what you're doing. And one of the things that really frustrates me is with the media, I constantly see stories about distributed denial of service but they never really give you anything of substance other than hacker group of the day said, to be clear, I like to use the term attacker. I, I sort of fumbled there myself. Um, I prefer that as opposed to hacker because I see that as our word. Um, and the media likes to try and scare you because they want you to look at their various sites. And they leave you with this sense of terror that something is creeping up behind you. But the security controls that are in place aren't always going to see the thing that's coming up after you. With media, they like to just put that fear into you. And this was one of the things that actually really I found wanting. I really was left with a rather empty sense after that. So that's where this talk was actually born out of. So the game plan for what I'm going to be talking about today, I'm going to go through uh, the actors, the attacks, tools, trends, data, and what can you do? And I, when I say what you can do, things that you can do now today that can help with your own environment. So one of the really interesting things starting off, and this has always intrigued me, are the actors for hire the mercenaries of the internet. And these have always uh, tickled me because uh, when I was doing contract work for the Department of Defense in the US years ago, we used to see these characters all the time. And they even tried to get us to hire them to do uh, various attacks on, oh, we'll attack country X for you. And I was like, no, go away. But the thing that really caught me was that you could actually have a bespoke implementation of their services. So this is a couple years out of date now, but it just gives you a rough idea. So this was from 2012, and this was from a Russian underground site that said, you know, we can do X, Y, and Z. And the really interesting thing was the DDoS botnet was only $700. Whether that was a one-time fee or a recurring fee, that wasn't entirely clear. But this was when we first saw, you know, in 2012, we really saw this coming to in, into its own right. And we saw, in, at least in North America, where somebody at a company hired a group like this to attack one of their competitors. This unraveled, and they caught the attackers, and the attackers flipped on the people that hired them, and they went to jail. But it's not all bad news. The really ironic thing is, when I first gave this talk at um, NorthSec in Quebec City, this was one of the things that I found was a group where you could co get, collect together various types of uh, hackers to do you know, penetration testing and things like that for you if you don't have them on staff. Because let's be, be honest, the, not everybody has these uh, bench strength 
available to them. So you could do this. The funny thing was, the day I presented this, about 24 hours later, they were compromised, and every single user that was using this service was actually exposed. So at least it was a good start. So I'll give them that. Now, the attackers, obviously, we're going to go through a really quick uh, versioning of this because, I mean, I know you guys are familiar with this thing. But with the first off, we have the bored kids. And this is one of the ones I always like to talk about because I see it as our duty collectively to go out and educate the kids today as to how not to get themselves thrown in jail. When I first started doing this sort of thing back when the world was flat, I didn't have any sort of guidance, but I had this little sixth sense of, I don't want to go to prison. So I learned to build my own systems and do my own tests in my own environment. Not everybody was actually quite so lucky or so smart. Um, and a lot of people went to jail. And even today, we see with all of these uh, implementations of various uh, cloud services for hire that do stress testing, we see a lot of people getting rounded up and sent to jail that really didn't know any better. And a lot of this is because we have the bored kid element. When I was a kid and was bored, I would go outside and play hockey, because that's what we did in Canada. Nowadays, kids have access to the internet. They're bored. They're looking for a cause. They're looking for a purpose, something to be a part of. Unfortunately, there's negative elements out there that will gladly conscript these folks into a disposable army, of, for want of a better term. And this is one of the things that really worries me, because a lot of these kids make decisions that are bad, and they don't have any understanding that they're actually making these negative choices. For example, when Heartbleed came out, let me just say that was a fun day. Uh, when Heartbleed came out, there was a kid in London, Ontario, and Canada who decided he was going to go after the Revenue Canada site, which is the site that's responsible for collecting taxes for Canada. None of us like them. Um, this kid particularly didn't like them and went after them using Heartbleed to see as much information as he could get. Within 24 hours, the Royal Canadian Mounted Police showed up, and we haven't heard from him since, so I don't know quite what happened with him. The problem with him is he was actually 18 years of age, which in Canada means you go to jail, do not pass go. So kids don't always make the right choices. You know, they'll see something that looks appealing, but may end badly. And the problem is it, it can not only end badly, it can actually come back to haunt you years later. And love or hate the ISC squared, uh, I serve on the board of directors at least for another two months. Um, one of the services they have is they have a service to actually help go out and teach kids as well. How many StarCraft fans we got in the room? Anybody? One guy. Two guys. All right. Well, StarCraft was a game back when, uh, in the 90s that I used to play. And these particular characters were called the Zerg. So every time you hold, the premise was you build up these resources, you build everything up, and then these guys would show up and destroy everything. These guys pissed me off. It was, if it wasn't for cheat codes, I would never have gotten anywhere. But this is how I envision denial of service every time I hear about it, because these guys are a pain in the ass. And we would see all kinds of sin floods and things like that that would attack our users. And it, it's really fun being able to actually mitigate these things. And the problem I see is that if you're not properly protecting your site, you, know, you could have the most amazing looking site, but if you can't protect it, you're stuck in the mud, or in this case, in a pile of sheep. So, I had hoped to give you our Q3 data, but apparently our report is not going out until December 2nd, so unfortunately, I'm only going to be stuck with the Q2 data, and I really apologize for that, because um, I was battling with our internal folks for right up until yesterday. So, here's an example of the type of attacks we see broken out based on infrastructure type attacks. The really interesting one that got me was SSDP was one of the top two attack types. I wrote an article about this, and I believe it was Forbes, and I just went through the whole type of thing. This is how this was a major uh, a ref uh, reflection attack. The Universal Plug and Play Consortium sent me a nasty gram. They said, Universal Plug and Play is perfectly safe. There's nothing wrong with it. This article is patently wrong. We'd like you to take it down. This is why we do the data, because I've seen too many times where articles will talk about attacks, but they talk about it in terms of hyperbole, and they want to actually scare people. But they don't actually give you any raw data, so I just go, well, we, we have data. So almost 16% of all the attack types in Q2 only, and that's actually since gone up, in Q2 were using this as their attack vector. So it was really interesting that they thought that you know, I would take it down because, yeah, that wasn't going to happen. And SSDP is a simple service discovery protocol, and this is actually something that shouldn't be available to be an attack, but it works. 
and this is one of the things that a lot of people don't take into account, is that when you're deploying services, be it SNMP, be it NTP, whatever it is, it's like patch your stuff, patch your systems, because if you're not keeping current on all the revisions of these things that you're exposing to the internet, you're actually becoming part of the problem, and that shouldn't be the case. We're all security professionals, this is what we do, so why is it that our environments end up contributing to this sort of thing? It's simply because, you know, I get it, we have resources, there's only so many hours in the day. I actively lobbied for 26-hour days and that failed, but that being what it is, it's, it's one of these things that we have to take into account is we have to own up to the responsibility of making sure our systems are up to date. Now, when we're talking about t different types of attacks, the one that really gets me is the uh, application layer attacks. These always focus on the logic, or not always, but focus on the logic of you know, your web forms and things to that effect and how your site is working. So just simple denial of service attacks have limited utility. Um, if you're using a service like ours or any of our other types out there, you know, that is going to have limited effect for the attacker. The where, the where they get the biggest bagging for the buck, and this is where they require some level of intelligence, is going after the application logic. It's simple to download a tool and go click, click, next, and I'll talk about some of these tools later, where you just launch an attack and you're like, oh, look, and I'm an attacker, and no, you're not. Uh, you just can click a button. And this is one of the things that gets me. So when we're looking at application type of attacks, these are the, things, these are the vectors that we saw from a denial of service per perspective and just in Q2. So HTTP GET was only accounting for less than 9% of the overall attack type. So less than 10% of the attacks were based over um, application uh, type of attacks. So it was really interesting. But the one thing that we saw rise to greater prominence was the extortion level attacks. Uh, in particular, it was DD4BC, which I'll talk about in a bit in a second. Now, the really last year, we saw these attacks where these sites were getting extortion notes saying they would get a burst of attack traffic and they would get an email saying, okay, we've attacked you. Now what you're going to do is you're going to give us X amount of Bitcoin or we're going to attack you again. The thing that really got us was, you know, the attack traffic at that time wasn't very high. It was pretty uh, ins insignificant in the grand scheme of things. But the amount of money they were asking for roughly equated to about between 80 and 150 dollars United uh, US dollars. And it's like, this is the oddest uh, extortion attempt I've ever seen. And it really struck us that this was actually, you know, this, I, I was really surprised that this was more of somebody testing out their new monster. And <laughs> In short order, we had the DD4BC, or Distributed Denial of Service for Bitcoin. Worst name ever, they need marketing people. And they began targeting sites, and the amounts went up, and in rather short order. So this is an example of an email that was sent to one of our customers saying, this is what we're going to do. The best part is, for those in the back that can't see, it says, we'd like to introduce ourselves. Here's some links. The only thing that really surprised me is they didn't say, Google us. Oh, wait, no, they did. Just Google DD4BC and you'll find out more info. So these were folks that were becoming more and more enamored with themselves that they were actually sharing their own press with their attack targets. It was really interesting. And they have progressively increased in their abilities to the point where now they're asking for 30 Bitcoin and I don't know what the current exchange rate is at this point, but it has been going up. So when they would launch these attacks, they have increased from half, easily half of this a year ago to they claim they can do between 400 and 500 gigabits per second. The reality was at the time that I did this particular slide, which was about um, a quarter ago, they had only gotten up to 50 gigabits in size for their attacks. And progressively, they will improve. It's just inevitable because they're expanding their platform. So they will get better at it. And this goes back to the amplification attacks. This is what I was talking about a moment ago. When we're talking about NTP, SNMP, and DNS as perfect examples, if we're not patched to current and we're not securing these uh, damage properly, we are part of the problem. And I mean all of us. It, it's something that we need to fix. We can do better at this. And it's incumbent upon us to take this message out to our respective organizations and say, look, are we part of the problem? Are we contributing to this? And one of the really interesting things was with these types of attacks that we see, one of the really one, fun ones was with DNS, we saw um, uh, using text records as amplification. So here's a sample anatomy of an attack. Um, I don't imagine this is news to anybody. Amount of traffic, reflecting off DNS, therefore amplifying the amount of traffic that's hitting the target. The cool part was this sample packet that we caught. 
attack, target. President Obama is taking action to ensure opportunity for... What? They had actually taken the time to take a press release from the U.S. White House, put it into their attacks to make a statement as well as while they're attacking. I was like, all right. Thereby increasing the amount of traffic, increasing the amount of volume of the attack. I'll give them credit. That was kind of neat in that respect. And, uh, and they, they voiced their opinion, whatever exactly that was. I'm not entirely sure. So now I'm going to talk about a little bit of the types of tools that we see because it's one of the things that really interests me is that with media types, we never see what kind of tools they're discussing. On occasion, they'll mention Brobot, but for all intents and purposes, they don't really talk about the different types of tools. And within the tool locker, we have you know, obviously volumetric, SQL injection, and so on and so forth. One of my favorite ones is, and I'm probably going to butcher this name because I always do Havage, or I'm assuming I presented that right. If I didn't, I apologize to the authors. This is a really handy tool. This is very simple if you want to do a SQL injection attack. You put in the information, you click go, boom. It's incredibly simple to use and freely available online. So the barrier to entry for an attacker has dropped precipitously over the years. When I first started out, we had to write all our own scripts, we had to do all this. Now you just download a tool and click a button and, oh, look at me, I'm attacking. And this really plays into this culture of, look how awesome I am because I can attack you, blah, blah, blah. And which is great up until the police show up. Because a lot of these tools do absolutely nothing to obfuscate the origin. Now this is one that we found in 2012, and I love this tool simply because of the name. So the Hulk tool uh, is HTTP Unbearable Load King is what it stands for. And it wasn't overly unbearable, but it was really interesting that it would send um, traffic at the site. And the user agent, you can make it a, a random value, but here's an example of the type of traffic you would see hitting your site. There's really nothing overly obvious about this particular traffic other than there would be this and millions of its friends. And it would do nothing to obfuscate the point of origin. So the attacker had to be sure that they were covering their tracks. And unfortunately, they did not. So as we go through these different types of tools, here's another HTTP flutter. This is called Donut. Being Canadian, we have our Tim Hortons. We love our donuts. Um, very simple. URL, port, number of threads, start. And this is the traffic that you would receive back. It's really, really simple. So anybody who has any ability to search Google or Bing, does anybody actually use Bing? No, didn't they? Oh, no, he's scratching. Um, so they're able to search this and find these tools in rather simplistic fashion. So I thought, okay, so they're not doing anything to obfuscate their point of origin. What would be an interesting way to change that? It's like, oh, okay, somebody thought of that. Taurus Hammer. This is kind of neat. This is a, a Python script, which actually leverages the Torp network to launch the attack, so obfuscating the point of origin. I was like, oh, okay, that's pretty in interesting. Um, but knowing folks like Runa and they're like over at Tor Project, not the kind of people I want to upset. I quite like them. So I didn't, never tested this tool myself. So this would do a low and slow across the Tor network. And this is really interesting. This is how simple it was to use. Tor's hammer, pick the IP address and the number of threads, and off it goes. So one of the things that we did was, in addition to this, this is just one example, there was other types of attacks that were going across the network, so what we did was we went through the amount of data that we had from collected on our platform and looked to see what kind of Tor-based attacks are we seeing. And don't get me wrong, I love Tor, I think it's a great idea, I think it's a wonderful thing. Unfortunately, it's much in the same vein as this nonsensical argument we're seeing about encryption right now in the media. People are going, encryption is evil. It would have stopped X, Y, and Z. And it's like, well, actually, encryption had nothing to do with X, Y, and Z. But this whole thing, people like to demonize what they don't understand, and Tor is a perfect example. But unfortunately, we have attackers that are leveraging us to launch attacks. The really interesting thing was port, port scanners and SQL injection were the main types of attacks that we saw going across the Tor network. And in we did a, a comparison with non-Tor-based IPs. And it was really interesting how they pretty much mapped it together on the types of attacks that we're doing. But uh, heaven forbid that people play along nicely. So here's an example of some of the targets that were being hit with Tor-based attacks. And when I say Tor-based, I mean they were just using it as how they get there. Retail and financial services were one and two. So what we saw previously with the Alcasam cyberfighters where they were attacking financial sites, namely banks and credit units and things to that effect, has now shifted because those 
individuals or individuals, those companies have gotten better at protecting their sites. And now the attackers have switched their attention to retail, which by and large has not done a, as wonderful a job as we've seen with Target, Home Depot, and so on and so forth. And admittedly, those were primarily targeting their point of sale systems, but not exclusively. So we do see a lot of that in the way of attack traffic. And if, heaven forbid I do things in order. So this is actually a capture from Donut, which I was talking about a moment ago. Here's the traffic for Donut, which again is really not all that obvious. There's nothing to say, aha, other than the volume. Now, when I talk about these tools, I'm sure everybody in the room knows about Lower Urban Ion Cannon. If you don't, this is a really funny little tool. This was something that was put out by Anonymous quite a few years ago now. And the whole idea was they were going to use this disposable workforce, this disposable army of kids to go out and attack sites. So they provided them a tool. And then they would go on Pastebin or whatever and say, here's the target we're going to hit, and this is the day we're going to hit it. Effective in its implementation, but the thing is, anybody using this tool, this tool did nothing to obfuscate their point of origin. So if they were attacking, all of a sudden, law enforcement had their IP address. Yes, IP address does not equal you are the attacker, but it sure causes you a headache when they show up. Um, and this is really interesting. So knuckleheads would join the fray. They would jump in, they'd click the button, they would attack, and the police would show up. So ultimately, it led, led to the natural progression to the high orbit ion cannon. The really interesting thing here was they were actually able to change this using what they called blaster packs, where they could change the type of attack that we were using, because low orbit ion cannon was very limited and very easy to block. High orbit ion cannon at least put, changed it up just a bit. And uh, again, this was an HTTP GET related type of attack. Simplistic, but effective. And then Brobot. Brobot was what I was talking about earlier with Alcazam Cyberfighters. This was a tool that they were using where they were leveraging compromised WordPress installations. It was not exclusively WordPress, but primarily. And uh, having run a WordPress site now for <coughs> excuse me, a uh, better part of 10 years, I can tell you it's a giant pain in the butt to keep secure. And I say secure. Um, so this botnet that they had built was extremely effective. And they were able to actually pivot very quickly. They could update it quickly. Um, it was rather impressive in its implementation, giant pain in the butt if you were a victim of it. But it, um, what they would do is, when they would attack a site, they would say, okay, we're going to attack you at this time, and it's going to run for X number of minutes. And they were true to their word, which is really interesting, because we saw with DD4BC, they would say, we're going to attack you. They wouldn't say how long or how, long, how much traffic they were going to throw at you. Now we see the Armada Collective, which has come up, which is basically a ditto of... Uh, DD4BC, they're trying the same type of thing, but they don't always make good on what they're going to say. They say they're going to attack, and sometimes they do, sometimes they don't. I don't know if they get bored and go for pizza. It's really an interesting one that we're still puzzling out. Now, while we're puzzling these sort of things out, we see Robot being you know, a pretty effective platform to tools like WGET. This drives me nuts, and this goes back to law enforcement and governments not understanding what they're afraid of and demonizing the things that they don't understand, like encryption. WGET is a very, very simple tool. I use it all the time. It's very effective for doing research. At one point in the media, they were demonizing this, saying it was an attack tool. And there was actually some legislators in North America that wanted to outlaw this, which is just, on, all right, um, not a good idea. And it's incumbent upon us to actually go forth and talk to these folks. We're very, very good at talking amongst ourselves. I, I stare at my navel all day long and I talk to myself. And this is one of the things that we have to do a better job of talking to the non-security types. We have to get the message across so we don't have to deal with crap like this. There's no good reason that we should be doing this. When I hear, uh, there was just last night on the television, there's a U.S. senator named, uh, I've forgotten his name already. Anyhow, he's on their intelligence subcommittee. I use the term intelligence loosely. He was saying that encryption uh, is a, it should be banned. It's, it's a real problem. It's helping the attackers. Now, to use the Paris example, which is very fresh, this was a close-knit group of people that all knew each other, lived together, and used SMS to communicate. Encryption was never part of the equation based on the published information to this point. I don't know if there's anything else. They just haven't come forth with that. That's still obviously in motion. But this is one of the things I worry about, that if we don't do a better job of speaking up, they're going to start taking away our VPN. They're going to take away our encryption to the point where we're going to become the outlaws. 
I mean, that has a certain cachet to it, but I really don't want to be on the run. So with the amount of data that we have, we actually have the ability to go through and look at all these different types of trends and see the things that are evolving. And there is some really new stuff. This particular piece here that I'm about to talk about is not that new, actually not that new in any way, shape, or form, but it has taken on a different view. And uh, I say media grandstanding, that usually says media horrors, but I decided to dumb it down. Now, a perfect example of these guys are the Lizard Squad. And I'm sure, it, who here has heard of Lizard Squad? Really? Oh, okay, that's less, not, less hands than I expected. This was a crew of attackers that were basically gamers on a, uh, a gaming platform that shall remain nameless, <coughs> that discovered very quickly that people that they didn't like that were getting a higher score on Destiny or whatever it happened to be, that they could kick them off. And they went, oh, okay, this is kind of neat. And they would actually launch denial of service attacks against these individuals on this gaming platform, and then they realized quite accidentally that they could actually knock out entire swaths of this particular network. And then they decided, oh, we're elite attackers. And then they started doing interviews. If you're doing criminal activity, one of the things you really don't want to be doing is doing television interviews with the BBC. <laughs> Two of them did do this. Uh, and as far as I know, they were actually uh, incarcerated now. <coughs> so I won't give them points for intellect in that particular case. But one of the things that they have done is they've actually done a good job of illustrating one of the new dynamics. When I say new dynamics, it's a great, greater prevalence, is the commoditization of distributed denial of service. We see all these different types of botnets that are being built out using home routers, using compromised systems, using whatever it happens to be that's attached to the internet. Toasters is probably next. <coughs> Pardon me. And what they're doing is they're providing a SaaS implementation of DDoS. And for a trivial amount of money, you can actually launch your own DDoS. Case in point, last year, almost uh, just uh, December last year, there was this article here about how, you know, for six, uh, six bucks a month, you could start your own DDoS. And they thought they could get away with this. I believe this platform is actually still up today because they keep moving it around. But <clears throat> one of the interesting things is when they first rolled out the platform, the platform was actually built on code from another group called the Titanium Stressor Crew. They did absolutely nothing to lock it down. Apparently, uh, HD access files are a, a novel idea for them. And so we were able to actually in incrementally go through the site. We were able to download the users, everything. It was amazing. But this was really the thing that really got me. You have your different packages. You could do monthly subscriptions for your dist distributed denial of service attack. The one that got me the most was $69.99 for 7,200 seconds a month. Or you could do the lifetime for 280. Lifetime has not been determined. Um, probably shorter than they would hope. But in, in terms of Canadian dollars, if you're looking at it from buying an Americano coffee at Starbucks, I used an example, I would not buy it. Um, but here, $69.99 a month. And take that and divide it by 30 days, average for a month. The cost ends up being less than a cup of coffee a day to launch an attack for 7,200 seconds. That may not seem like a lot, but for a site that's unprotected that you just happen to be annoyed with, that could cause them a great deal of heartache and cause them serious financial penalties, or cost at least. So the first part of that I was talking about where they were talk uh, targeting uh, folks on the gaming network, this is a perfect example. They used what was called a booter that could actually target the individual users and knock them offline. So it was, so it was um, really interesting in that regard. Is that, that tool that they would use it was for, basically based on a rivalry. It's like kicking people off because, you know, it was kind of annoying. But that gave birth to the stressor. Now, these are platforms that actually legitimately exist in the past. I used to use one back in the 90s for one of the financial institutions I was working at. We would actually run stress tests against our site to see how our application would stand up under load. So there were legitimate uses for these. But the thing is, calling it a stressor is a legal artifact. The idea that they're using it by calling it a stressor saying, we're providing you a tool they're hoping that they're not going to get arrested by calling it a stressor because, well, we're providing the tool, but how you happen to use it is a different thing. And when you flip it on its head and you look at it, it's like, I have a hammer. I can build a house or I can build, beat you about the head with it. It goes back not to the tool, to the intent. Unfortunately, the intent with these different platforms is not so much of a noble cause. But here's an example of some of the different types of booters and stressors that we've seen in our 
in our travels, you know, various types here, but my favorite one here, simply from the marketing aspect, apparently this platform is absolutely terrible, but Big Bang Booter. And I will get into that in one second here because this, let's see if this works. Here we go. This is a video that we found online for Big Bang Booter. It's where they're generating revenue. It really has gone around the other way. So some of the other highlights that we've seen in our uh, journeys are, you know, different types of crews that are arising or rising up to copy folks like DD4BC. We're seeing more of those popping up. Um, Joomla and other SaaS-based apps have been targeted rather frequently. And the thing that really gets me, I'll skip right to the bottom, data breaches are fueling login attacks. This is one of the things that drives me absolutely batty because all the different types of sites out there, if you go and you buy something on Amazon, you put in your username and password. Everyone in here uses a different password for each site, right? Okay, there's head nods. Unfortunately, folks like our parents or non-technical friends don't do this. Human nature being what it is, we can remember username, we can remember password. Ah, we don't have to have the different one for different sites, do we? This is the problem, because attackers are able to compromise a site, download all the usernames and passwords, as we see all too frequently in the media, and then what the attackers do is they take those and run them against different sites. So if I can get your username and password from whatever site and you're using it on your banking, using it on Amazon, I can take a lot of money out of your pocket in very short order. So this is one of the things that drives me absolutely nuts, is attribution. And the media loves to blame somebody. And I don't care about this. What I do is I care about is the data. So, the information I'm about to show you is actually just raw data. There is nothing to be gleaned from this other than this is where the attacks originated in Q2 based on IP. Whether or not they actually came from these points of origin is another thing entirely because we don't track it back even further than that because there's only so many hours in the day. And it was really interesting that in Q2, China came in at 37%, but in Q1, they were only about 10% of the attacks. So this actually varies from quarter to quarter, and read from it what you will. And so with the different types of attacks, we see the primary number of uh, 100 gigabit plus a type attacks have been hitting uh, primarily internet telecom as well as gaming. So these are the types of targets that people are going after from just the sheer DDoS uh, huge volume type of attacks. And we break that out. This is, obvious, this is Q2, obviously. Um, gaming and software and technology are huge, but the ones that I worry about are not just financial services, but is retail on here? Retail is not on, yes, yeah, retail. Retail, it shows up low there, but that is steadily increasing. Why? Because the same information that the attackers were going after in the financial services, they can just pull that from retail sites, which by and large have not got the same level of security for the most part, some of them are doing a very good job, don't get me wrong, but some of them are not, and it's easier to pick off the low-hanging fruit. Because if I'm an attacker, I really don't want to be spending a lot more work and time on it to get the money that I want. I want to go after what's going to work. So, go after retail. Uh, that is nice. Let me see, i got five minutes. So, uh, so this is normalization of web attacks for, by industry. Again... For the web attacks, and when I'm saying this is application-level based attacks, financial services and retail, again, were the primary targets. Why? Financial information. Now, let's skip there. So, with SIN floods, this is really interesting. Uh, this is how simple it is for a SIN flood that we would see at our perimeter. This particular packet was part of a 321 gigabit DDoS attack that we were uh, having fun with. It was rather amazing, it was something that simple. So what are we seeing as a progression? We've gone, this, this particular chart, for those of you in the back can't see, going from Q1 2013 to Q2 2015, you can see that with this graph, we're plotting out the different types of attacks, both on volume and in time. As you can see, it naturally grows to a, a much greater density in Q2 2015. For Q3, that's almost a smudge at this point because that has increased yet again. It's really interesting in this IQR chart to actually see that sort of graphic representation. So, types of attacks that we're doing, uh, or we're seeing rather, uh, SQL injection is the primary one that drives me absolutely bonkers, because SQL injection is still a problem. How many people remember the first time SQL injection showed up on the OWASP top 10? Anybody have an idea? I'll give you a hint. 
over 10 years ago. Why is this still a problem? Why are we still combating this? This is something that is a solvable problem, but this counts for roughly 35% of the successful attacks that we see out there. This is, shouldn't be the case. We need to sanitize inputs, we need to sanitize outputs. This is a solvable problem, and a lot of this falls to companies and you have managers that have a deadline to meet, so they're working very hard to make sure that they get their product out in front of the customer as fast as they can. So what's the best way to actually shorten that time? Bypass security. I used to be one of the gates for a financial institution. My team would actually vet any application that would be public facing. We had one that went right around us. Luckily, we found it the day they went live and we were able to take it offline and we did a test on it. If anybody had actually taken a swing at it, that would have gone down very quickly because they had done some very simple coding errors that would have resulted in a problem. So security, as frustrating as it may be for developers, is there for a reason to help protect the, the uh, organization. How am I doing? Five minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, just slip, all right, I'll slip past that. One of the other things that we saw was file inclusion was a big thing, uh, remote file inclusion. So this one here is for uh, RevSlider, which for WordPress is a um, plugin that would allow you to actually shift the images on the front page. So if you went to a WordPress site and you, you've seen the images that slide across and change, visually quite appealing, but an earlier version of this, uh, it was about a year ago now, uh, was susceptible to a SQL injection attack, and it would allow people to upload stuff like this, uh, which would give them a shell, and so they called the RevSider shell. This was really interesting because this sort of attack and others like it were based on these types of issues. CVE for Open Flash, AppBrain, it, the part I want people to see is these CVEs, CVE 2009, CVE 2012, CVE 2008, this is from Q2 of this year. These were successful attacks for things that have been known issues for years. We have to do a better job of securing our environments. And I'm gonna slip by that. All right, so with regards to our applications and anything that we have forward facing to the external parties, we wanna make sure that we're not becoming one of these. We wanna make sure that we're not contributing to the problem. We want to make sure that we're doing proper updates on our systems. Because how long is it before law enforcement starts coming around knocking on your door and saying, well, because of your negligence, your inability to keep your systems current, you're now culpable because you participated in this attack. It hasn't happened yet, but I've heard rumblings to this effect. It's only a matter of time before somebody starts doing this. So what do you do? Yeah, yeah, vendor, got it, I understand. But SQL injection is a solvable problem. This shouldn't be an issue. This is something that application developers in your own houses can fix. Please take the time to do that. Want well, to do a better job of hardening your systems. If I can do a directory traversal on your site in 2015, you will have a problem. Work with your ISPs that are next hop up from your, uh, if you're not doing a cloud implementation for your servers, if you have like classic interior architecture, talk to your ISPs. They may have some sort of mitigation strategy in place. They may have something that can help you. I know when we asked our ISP back in the 90s, they looked at us like we had three heads. I'm willing to bet that you have a better response these days. I hope. You want to look at IP rate limiting, and I keep going back to this one. Patch your systems. Make sure that you have proper web hygiene because otherwise you're becoming part of the problem. So the data that I've presented to you today is actually pulled from the stateoftheinternet.com and this is a freely available uh, report that we do quarterly so that we have all this data that we pour into these reports. This is free for you guys to use in any way you see fit. Uh, we have a lot of customers that use it for building business cases or just you know better education for their C-suite. Feel free to use it, it's free, it's there for you to use. That being said, I would like to thank you very much for your time and attention today. I'd like to thank DeepSec, and I really appreciate the opportunity to speak here with you today. So, do we have questions? Go there. Mark Rubio? Mark Rubio? No. <laughs> Uh, so I want to ask, um, yep. there have been some, uh, uh, about the Protonet case. Uh, so there was some blog posts by the guys who run Protonet. There was a, oh, right, some, ProtonMail, yeah. Um, some, ProtonMail, yeah, yeah. sorry. 
Um, and there was there's some kind of speculation in the first post, the nation state attacker came across in the second, not so much. Do you have any data on this? We do, but we haven't anything that's been published yet. Um, I, I'll leave it at that. Suffice it to say, that one is not one I'm well versed on, so I'd be rather speaking out of school to actually talk to that at length, so I won't do that to you. But uh, I am familiar with it. So. Oh, on your left. Thank you. Um, for the beginning of your talk, you talk about the, the children. There is something we saw in France after murderer in Charlie attack uh, in January. Um, you had two group of anonymous fighting themselves. One uh, from uh, French one attacking Arabic websites. Other with Arabic uh, attacking French websites mm -hmm. and just everywhere like camping website and stuff like that. And what we saw is uh, children making lots of dedos, lots of dedos, lots of dedos, but really, really young kids. And after that, uh, people selling databases on uh, black market. Yep. Every time, all the databases you can find in this site. And it was crazy because you just see there what you said about uh, the, the using they are doing of those children. That's yep. this really was crazy. Workforce. Yeah, we can, we can verify that with this event. It's an unfortunate reality that we have to do a better job of educating our kids. I've got two of them, and one of them likes to VPN into other countries to get content on Netflix, so she's going to be a problem. <laughs> <laughs> she's been doing that since she was five. <laughs> I am so screwed. <laughs> so, do we have more questions? Oh, Great. Look at them. Then, thank, thank you. Thank you very much.